The wrath of God is a good thing. It's not an all-powerful entity gone mad. When we think about the phrase of wrath of God, many people make the mistake, as I said before, of applying our own human passions, our feelings of wrath, because they typically start with selfishness and sin. And God is never selfish, and there is no sin in him. So when we hear this phrase, the wrath of God, we know that it's not coming from a place of personal anger at being wronged. Today's sermon on our website has a fuller definition of the wrath of God from Albert Barnes, but I wanted to summarize it for you. Wrath usually shows up in us when someone has harmed us or my rights have been violated. Think about the last time that you were really angry. It could have been on the way here in the car. It could have been in the parking lot just before you got to the door, and then you said, oh, I have to check that at the door. How many have had that happen at least on some Sunday, if not this Sunday, right? You're getting ready for church in the, the car or the van with the family. There's just chaos going on. We want what we want, and we will sin to get it, even if it's something that we think is good, like peace and quiet. Why can't we just have peace and quiet? Why can't it be nice and we're just sitting here together, but that doesn't go the way we want and wrath comes out? But a father who won't allow disobedience, but corrects his children in a disciplining or a learning way, a discipling way, that father is admired. A government official who keeps the law and punishes criminals is reelected. God is opposed to all crime and injustice across the entire universe. His wrath against evil is the proper way of preserving peace and order and excluding the guilty from the blessings that are reserved for the righteous. So we need to think about the wrath of God in a different way. Instead of us thinking about it as, "Uh uh-oh, God's really mad now, it's this is a pure and holy way of keeping justice, preserving peace, making things right the way they're meant to be. Our sermon series from the book of Jonah is called Running from God's Grace, and the theme woven throughout it is His grace his goodness, his love, and his care for us when we don't deserve it. As we continue in Jonah, we continue to see our need to love the spiritually lost and to share God with others. Throughout this narrative, we're encouraged as we see God's sovereignty. He's in control of everything. He's in control of the weather. He's in control of fish and where they're going to be and when They're going to do something. He's in control of people. Even though they have their own ability to make decisions, he is orchestrating history the way that it's supposed to go. God always knows what he's doing, and his plans don't go unhinged, even when he tells us to do something and we run from him. We go the opposite direction. In chapter 3 today, we have a repeat of chapter 1. God calls Jonah again. He calls him to go preach a message to the people of Nineveh. And this time, things are a little bit different. So we're going to see what happens. If you missed the previous messages, you can find them on our website. You can find them on Facebook, uh, also on our YouTube channel. And in your bulletin, there's a QR code on the back of it. So if you want to get caught up and see how this all started the ending will make a little bit more sense for you. If you're watching online with us, we're really glad you're here with us. Uh, You can look up that message series and you can find all of Jonah together. So we're going to read chapter 3. Cindy was talking to me about this before. We're on our, I think, our eighth message, maybe in the book of Jonah. And the first chapter took many weeks. We spent a lot of time in there because we were laying the groundwork for a lot of these principles. And now Chapters are flying by because the narrative is continuing, but we've built on that foundation. So if you want to 
follow along in your Bible, it's Jonah chapter 3, sandwiched between Obadiah and Micah, near the end of the Old Testament. If you're using one of the Bibles in the pew in front of you, the black Bible, it's page 727, and in the red Bible, it's page 921. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He's shouting this in the streets. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. If you like taking notes or you want to just make sure you stay awake, in the bulletin is a little insert, and that has some blanks that you can fill in. Our first blank is repent. If you were here with us for our very first Jonah message, that was all the way back in March. I pointed out the parallels between chapters 1 and 3 and then chapters 2 and 4. It's almost like the story is being retold but moving forward in time. So the beginning of chapter 3 is almost identical to chapter 1, but there are some key differences. Listen to chapter 1 as you look at chapter 3 in your Bible. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Chapter 1 begins with, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And chapter 3 starts with, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. It's showing us, this is a parallel. This is like deja vu all over again. The word of the Lord has come to Jonah a second time. But this time, Jonah obeyed and did what God told him to do. Instead of fleeing to Tarshish, he went to Nineveh, that exceedingly great city. That's a new adjective to let us know that this is really an impressive city. The city was so big that it took Jonah a full day just to reach the center of it. And as he walked, he called to the people to repent of their sins against the one true God. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He's preaching the message that God gave him. He probably said some more words besides this because they understood that God was angry at their repent. God would overthrow or destroy the city in 40 days. God was giving them time to not only hear the message, but to process it and to respond. We can assume that this was not all he said. He likely explained more about who God was, and he told them to repent specifically of their sins of violence and sinfulness. And then an amazing thing happened. The people actually repented. How many of you have prayed for someone that you care about to become a believer? You've shared the gospel with them over and over again, 
and you think this is just never going to happen. And then you share with them again, and they say, yes, today's the day. I'm ready to be saved. Sometimes we're shocked by that because we think, I've done this. There's nothing different. And that's when we realize it's not about us. It's about God. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts people of sin. It's not our perfect words or even our deliverance. It's sharing the gospel and letting the Holy Spirit do the work. And that's why we're called to do it over and over and over again. The Apostle Paul said, some of us are planting the seed, but someone else may come along and water. And then it's maybe another person who sees the harvest, actually sees that person come to know the Lord. Years ago, we listened to an an evangelist talking about how to share our faith. And he said, on average, people have heard the gospel seven times before they respond. And this is the people who do respond. Some of you may remember our former missionary who came and shared with us that his brother accepted Christ on his deathbed. When we had been praying for him as a church family and uh, Ken had been praying for his brother and didn't lose hope. He kept praying and finally he responded. That wasn't the seventh time. It was probably the 7,000th time that he had heard the gospel. So don't give up hope. Keep praying and keep sharing the good news. The word repent means to turn away from, to do a 180, not just to feel bad about what you did, but completely turn away from it. I'm not going to keep going in this direction anymore. I'm turning away from it, and I'm going to God. I'm leaving that sin behind. I'm repenting of it. The ESV translate the Jewish word repent as turn. So depending on what translation of the Bible you have in front of you, you may see the word repent multiple times, but as I read through it, I'm seeing the word turn many times. The people from greatest to least, the richest to the poorest, heard God's word and they responded with great humility they repented. We would call this today a revival, right? When lots of people respond to the good news and repent. They put on sackcloth. And the closest thing we have to that would be like a potato sack. How many of you remember doing potato sack races when you were a kid? Or maybe still you like to do them as an adult. You, you step into that potato sack, and if you're wearing shorts, they're pretty itchy, right? The burlap is made out of cheap coarsely woven material, and it doesn't feel good. So imagine wearing a robe of sackcloth. You're you're itchy and you're uncomfortable. It's humbling instead of wearing something comfortable and nice. The king himself heard the message of repentance, and he too was humbled before God, and he repented. Instead of wearing his fine silk or linen robes, imagine what a king would be wearing, royalty. Everything that touches him has been washed and is as soft as possible so that it doesn't hurt his royal skin. Takes that off and he puts on sackcloth and he sits in ashes. This is a sign of universal humility. Sitting in ashes shows up in Job 2. And in Job 42, it shows up in Ezekiel 27, and again in Matthew 11. Someone who is, it's like down in the dumps. You're just sitting in the ashes. Sometimes they poured ashes on their heads. They wore burlap, and it was a symbol of humility and repentance. I'm as low as I can get. God, forgive me. The king made an official proclamation that everyone in the land, even the animals, have to fast, give up eating and drinking, wear sackcloth, repent, turn from their violent, evil lifestyle, and cry out to the one true God. Nineveh was a pagan city in a pagan land. They had a God for everything. And Jonah is there saying, the one true God is offended by your sin. And he's going to destroy you and your city if you don't repent. And I love this phrase. The king says, who knows? 
Maybe God won't zap us. They still repent. They're not doing this just because they want to look good. They're doing it because they have been humbled. But notice, like the sailors, they weren't trying to make a deal with God. They repented with the hope that God might not judge them. The sailors cried out to their gods, and then they realized that Jonah was there, and they heard that he was from the one true God, the one who made the storms, who made the sea and the land, and they said, we need to pray to him, even if it doesn't save us. That's real repentance. It's not just saying, God, save me from my sin, but God, I'm humbled before you. I recognize who you are. But unlike the sailors in the boat, it doesn't say anything about the people of Nineveh continuing to follow God. They didn't offer sacrifices. They didn't make vows and promises to follow God. The king and the people of Nineveh repented of their sin, but it doesn't say that they became followers of the one true God, that they became lifelong um, convert, converts to Israel or to the one God. The Hebrew word used for God, and this is just a little clue that one of the commentators talked about, the Hebrew word, even though we just keep seeing it as God, it's Elohim, which means the true God, the one God. Instead of the more personal form of God, which is Yahweh, and that means my covenant God, the one who's made promises to me and I promise to follow. So that covenant God is the one that you would use personally as my God. And they're just saying, God, the creator of the universe, we have offended you. This can happen with people today. People hear the gospel. They hear about their sin. They repent. They turn away from it. But then they're just going through the motions of faith. There's no real heart change. No new life in Jesus Christ. And Jesus warned about the final judgment. He said, they're going to be, be before me sheep and goats, and I'm going to separate them out. The sheep are the one who know me, and I know them. They hear my voice, and they follow me. They're going to pass into everlasting life. But the goats, even though they say we followed you, even though they say we did good deeds in your name, I never knew you, and you never really knew me. We don't need to live our lives in fear or doubting that God loves us, but we do need to look for evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in the lives of loved ones around us, to see our hearts changing little by little. And that's one of the struggles we have is just because we've overcome something, we think everybody else should have overcome that, right? We have a conviction about something and we want everyone else to be convicted of that thing. God works in each of us in different ways, at different times, at different speeds. So we need to show grace to one another. But we need to make sure that we're not counting on a short prayer that we made years ago or even decades ago, a prayer of repentance, and we think, well, we've got it covered. If there's been no spiritual growth, if there's been no spiritual fruit, the Apostle Paul tells us to look at our salvation in fear and trembling, to recognize that we're standing before a holy God and have we truly accepted his love and grace or are we still trying to do it on our own? That's something for us to consider in our own hearts. So the people repented and next they did justice. The second fill in the blank is doing justice. One of our descriptive words for God is just. Just like righteous wrath, it's part of his character. It's who he is. Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. God, as a ruler, as the king of our earth and a king of the universe, your throne is established on righteousness and justice. When we think about our rulers today, our politicians, a lot of times that is not their platform. It's not righteousness and justice. 
It's a lot of other things. But when we look at God, we know that he's just. We quote Romans 3.23 often, but often we leave out the second verse that completes the thought. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We are justified. God's justice is satisfied. It's completed by grace, a gift through the redemption of Jesus Christ. We can be made right with God. We can be made righteous only through Jesus' blood and his death on the cross. So God himself is just. He needs us to follow that line of justice and have our sins taken care of. But he also calls us to act out and promote justice, to live righteously or rightly before others. Zechariah 7.10 says, Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, the traveler, or the poor. Let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. As a church, we hear that widow and fatherless part, and we, we jump on that. We say, yes, we're going to take care of our widows. We're going to make sure that anyone that doesn't have a father or doesn't have a parent, we're going to care for them. The sojourners, the travelers in our land, the immigrants, that's the word we would use for them today, or the poor, don't oppress them. Don't make life harder for them. God wants justice. He wants to see them also thrive and have an opportunity. And let none of you devise evil against another. He calls us to do justice, to do what is right. When we are treated unjustly, as I said before, we get pretty hot under the collar. It's one thing to suffer punishment for your own sin, if you're willing to recognize it and say, yes, I did this, and yes, I deserve this. But when we're wrongly accused, when we're unfairly punished, we go ballistic. We go crazy when that happens to us or sometimes to someone around us. From childhood, we don't like to see injustice. As kids, we shout, that's not fair, right? When an innocent person is punished, and when a guilty person gets away with it, that drives us crazy. My office is right here with a window to the playground, and I hear this all day long. That's not fair. It's my turn. He did this. He did that. The teacher tries to get somebody in trouble, and they get the wrong person, and that just drives kids crazy because they have a very, very black and white version of justice. Maybe you remember that, or maybe you still experience that at home. Sometimes we would rather that no one gets ice cream than the guilty person gets it after misbehaving, right? And you hear dad say, that's it, nobody gets ice cream tonight. And you feel, okay, as long as my brother doesn't get it, because he's the one that deserves the real punishment. We want to see bad behavior punished. We want to see good behavior rewarded. But that is usually not the world we live in. Our high school students are going to be recognized next week. Some of them are graduating in the upcoming weeks. And as they're getting ready to go off and find jobs to make their own way, maybe to study some more and get ready for a career, they will get frustrated by the injustices of the world. Mom and dad may have protected them from a lot of them and absorbed some of that so they haven't seen it up close. And their typical response that they're going to hear is, welcome to the real world. Welcome to the real world. Now you're seeing what we've been dealing with. This is how it is. Just deal with it. But God is a God of justice. He not only called the people of Nineveh to repent of their sins, the evil that they were doing against each other, but he called them to act justly towards one another. It wasn't enough from God's point of view to just say, I just want you to be nice. I want you to 
live out justice. Stop your evil ways and do justice. Do the right thing instead of doing the wrong thing. God is concerned with injustice around the world. And many people today think that if there is a God, that he could care less about this world because we look around us and we see so many people suffering. So many people that we think have done absolutely nothing to deserve it. They're suffering. But that is so far from the truth. God cares for justice. It's part of his design. And it's part of the way he designed us. He eventually will judge all injustice. But he works today to combat injustice as well. As his image bearers, as those that are supposed to show his character to the world, we should be showing justice and doing justice, righting wrongs, rewarding the righteous and the good, punishing those who break the rules or who harm others. Just as God can't brush sin under the rug, as a society, we can't just ignore violations against the rules of order. As Christians, this is the way that we shine light in a dark place. When we help someone with absolutely no ulterior motives, when we want nothing in return from them, we show them God's agape or unconditional love. And that is part of how we show and do justice. We should be people who not only do what's right, but promote what's right fighting against injustice and trying to show Christ-likeness through compassion and help for other people. Today's message is doing justice and preaching wrath. And it sounds like those two things are at opposite ends of a scale, but they're not. They're who our God is. God's message to the people of Nineveh was not just be nice to each other for the sake of niceness, it was a message of dire warning. Judgment is coming. In 40 days, you will be destroyed if you don't repent. As I shared at the beginning, God's wrath towards sin is always to see justice carried out. It's not sinful anger or blowing up because something didn't go his way. God's not seated on his throne saying, now I'm really mad, I'm finally going to do something. God is acting in a way to see righteous commands followed, to see people turn away from their sin and follow him, to live their lives the way he designed us to live instead of living lives that hurt others and hurt ourselves. It would be unloving to only carry out social justice, just to give people help, to give people money, but not tell them about God's judgment of sin, the way to be right with God. And sadly, those opposites are what happen in the church today and probably through the centuries. There's a spectrum of churches, those who feel so strongly that they need to do social justice, they need to help people, they need to right wrongs, are often ashamed of the gospel. They don't want to talk to people about their sin they don't want to openly share the way to have peace with God because they don't want to offend anyone. They don't want to tell anyone, this is wrong. You need to do the right thing. Our society has moved so far to that end of the pendulum that no one can do anything wrong. Pretty, so, pretty soon, if you type the word wrong on your Microsoft Word document, it's going to exit out and say, this is not a word. There's nothing wrong anymore. Everything is okay as long as you're fine doing it. At the other end of the spectrum are people who won't shy away from preaching wrath, the sinfulness of man, the coming judgment, the terrors of hell, and why we don't want people to spend an eternity there. But often this group shies away from compassion and giving physical or financial help to those in immediate need because that's not going to save them. They're just going to go right back to 
what they were doing before. That's what we hear ourselves say sometimes. How is this going to help this person if they don't get saved? James, the brother of Christ in his epistle said, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works doing justice? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, and doesn't give them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Just to tell someone, feel better without giving them food or clothes is not going to help them. So my question for us, because we're probably on that end of the spectrum, right? We, we love to preach the truth. The, the gospel is what we want to share. Can we find something in the middle ground where we show love and compassion so that people know that we care about them? That they know that God loves them, that they can understand that there are people who want to help them with absolutely no strings attached. Can we do that along with clearly preaching about sin and God's wrath? I think we can. We need to share God's love, and that includes helping people today as, long, as well as helping them see how to have peace with God for eternity. Saying, be warm, be filled, is not going to help anyone but loving them, caring for them, and sharing the gospel that God is just and that his wrath will be carried out on all sin is truly loving. Tim Keller said, to work against social injustice and to call people to repentance before God interlock theologically. Tim Keller is a pastor from New York who just passed away recently. He said, to work against social injustice and to call people to repentance before God interlock theologically. We can't do one without the other if we're truly going to love people. So our takeaways this morning, our moral code for behaving and treating other people, that was written by God. We're not free to make up our own definitions of the meaning of life or what is true. A lot of people go on searches for that. I'm trying to find the real meaning of life. I'm trying to find truth. This is where you find it. You don't find it in yourself. You don't find it in the middle of the woods. You don't find it in a quiet, peaceful place where there's no one there but you. You need to hear from God what the meaning of life is, what the purpose is. Purpose of life is to bring glory to God to every end of the earth. That's your purpose in life, to bring him glory, to show other people what he's like. God did this at the beginning of time. The same physical laws that he created, like gravity and inertia, that our universe have operated on for we don't know how long, but a really long time. None of those laws have changed. So why would we expect moral laws to change with the times? Why would we think that they need to adapt to our modern preferences and we need to change what God said is true? The physical truths stay constant and the spiritual truths stay constant. Have you repented of your sins? If Jonah walked in here today, first of all, we'd be surprised because he's really old. But if he walked in today and said, repent or in 40 days you're going to be destroyed, how would you respond to that? Would you accept, first of all, that you have something to repent of? If you've read the Ten Commandments, you probably could find at least one in there that you've broken this week, today. We stand before God as sinners. 
unable to save ourselves. And the Bible tells us that the only way that God's judgment on sin can be satisfied is the blood of Jesus Christ. Only through him. Jesus said that himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus couldn't have been a kind, nice teacher and have said that statement if he wasn't really the Son of God, if he really wasn't the only way. He was telling the truth because he wanted people to be able to have a relationship with his heavenly Father. The only way to escape judgment, the only way to have peace with God, the only way to live your life the way God designed it is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, to repent of your sins, to turn away from them and say, now, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want my life, my heart to change. I want to be your disciple. If you've never done that, then I would invite you to come talk to me after the service. If you're watching online, you can contact me through the church office, and we'd love to let you know how you can know for sure that you have eternal life. Maybe you repented of your sins a long time ago. You changed some of your behavior. You've been trying really hard, but like the people of Nineveh, you never really started following God. You're not living your life as his disciple. Then that means that you too need to be saved. The words of a prayer you maybe said at VBS or in a Sunday school class once don't mean anything if faith didn't follow that. If you didn't give your life to Jesus Christ and say, I want you to be my savior. I want to follow you and you alone. Then maybe you still need to be saved. You can come talk to me. Maybe you're a Christian who thinks that the hurting sinners of the world are getting just what they deserve. They made their bed, now they have to lie in it. They made bad choices, and guess what? There are consequences to those choices. We say that and things like that a lot of time to our kids as parents, don't we? We don't show a lot of grace when they mess up. We want them to recognize this is what happens when you do the wrong thing. And sometimes as Christians, we can become calloused like that and say, yeah, that person across the street sitting on the curb with no job and no prospects, they're getting just what they deserve. Let them, let them stay there. Is your compassion for the broken and the lost lacking because you've forgotten all that you've been saved from? Not just your original sin at the time that you were saved as a believer, but daily, I'm still making the wrong decisions. As Paul said, I know the right thing to do, but I still choose the wrong thing. Oh, wretched man that I am. But God sent his son, Jesus, to pay for my sins, to forgive me, and for me to, in turn, forgive and love others. That's the part that we often leave out where we're all about accepting that grace and, and God's forgiveness, but then, like Ebenezer Scrooge, we just want to keep it to ourselves. We don't want to share that love, that compassion with anybody else. We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth. That's our work to do. We need to do justice and preach wrath. We need to show God's love and mercy we need to tell the truth about sin and judgment. It's not one or the other, it's both. Bradley and Hannah are going to come up and sing with, with us and for us one last time. Don't cry. I started tearing up when Bradley was playing. I told you not to cry. That meant I should also not cry, but we've been so blessed to have you with us, and thank you for leaving Haley behind, so we know you'll... Come back and visit us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we could come together and worship you, that we could sing our praises to you, that we could share communion together, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for your word, for your honesty about our condition, that we are sinners who can't save ourselves. And thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to pay for my sins, 
to pay for the sins of the world. And all you ask us to do is humble ourselves before you and accept this gift by faith. Lord, I pray that anyone this morning that doesn't know you, today would be the day that they would begin a new path in their lives, that they would turn to you, turn away from their sins, accept the gift of eternal life, and follow you. And Lord, as believers, help us to have love and compassion, to do justice, to love mercy, and to share about the wrath of God, the coming judgment, that we don't want to see anyone experience themselves. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is never in vain. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, I pray. Amen.